everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome to February's Lunch and Learn. Um, I am Tracy Bisson and I am broadcasting live from Golden Dog Adventure Company headquarters. And I am here with one of our newest members, Laura Bush. How are you, Laura? I'm good. How are you? Good. Thanks for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. So Laura is dog mom to Sadie and Everest, correct? Everest yes. is your second dog? Now, yes. I know we haven't met Everest, have we? Uh, one time I brought her to one of the walks, um, probably about like a month or two ago. I usually okay. Have <laughs> okay. And one of the things, um, that Laura, uh, deals with, like many of our members, including myself is we love a reactive dog. So if you are not familiar with what a reactive dog is, basically it is a dog that overreacts to something in their environment, some sort of stimuli, whether that they are, are nervous around people or other dogs, or they react to UPS driving up the driveway or children running around. Um, it's a number of things. And people, uh, you know, like Laura and myself who own reactive dogs struggle with having them in an environment where there's a lot of dogs. So that is kind of the journey we're going to talk with you about today, how uh, Laura has come to our events and has found a comfort level for herself and for Sadie. Um, and I'm really excited about this because I know um, it's it's been quite a journey for you. And I remember conversations that we've had in the past about your comfort level, being nervous, you know, feeling like you might be embarrassed if Sadie were to act out or uh, do other things that you felt people might judge you for. And that is so common that we hear from people. Um, so, you know, you and I had conversations, we had email exchanges. And I think the very first event, correct me if I'm wrong, that you came to, wasn't that the one at Wagon Hill Farm with uh, misbehavior? Yeah, so that one, uh, we came to Wagon Hill. That was probably our third or fourth walk. Um, the first one we came on was a Concord one. Um, it was by the river. That's and right. That was our very first walk with you guys. Um, I think that was back in uh, May or June of 2022. So, okay. Yep. I, I think, was that the Jim Hill River Walk? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That yep. That's right. That's right. Well, tell me if you can take uh, people listening to this kind of through your journey, starting out with, you know, what was your mindset when you heard about this opportunity and what were you thinking, you know, with exposing Sadie and Everest to the pack um, and, you know, just kind of take us through your thinking there? Yeah. So I actually first heard about it. Um, I don't remember. I think I was Googling and I saw the Century Explorers at the mall. Um, so that was our, actually our very first event with you guys. Um, and Sadie has been doing nose work now for a couple of years. And I was like, oh, it sounds like a great experience for her. Like, it'll be so great. Um, so I attended that event um, for the first one. And I was super nervous. I knew there was going to be lots of dogs. Um, Sadie has come a long way with her human reactivity. Um, but her dog reactivity um, was taking some time to work on with her. Um, so the first one, uh, that one I was super nervous about. Um, but I came in and I saw your face and you were super welcoming. Um, you told us to come on in and Sadie was barking a little bit and you didn't even like blink twice at that. Um, a lot of people would normally um, kind of give us, you know, a side eye or something, um, you know, based on her behavior, but like all of the members and including you, like it was, I felt super comfortable um, the first time just walking in with her. So it was a really good experience for her. Well, that's great to know. And, you know, it's funny when you say um, when dogs are vocal, I always equate it to, you know, standing in the line, uh, in a line at the grocery store and there's uh, a parent there with a crying child, you know, all kids cry all dogs bark. And even in that situation, I think people are judged because your child is crying in line and your child should be perfect. And, you know, it's the same thing with dogs. Dogs are not perfect. They're perfectly imperfect, which is why we love them so much. And they vocalize, especially if they are nervous or uncomfortable in a situation, you know, and you're another member who has done a great job of really understanding Sadie's needs and working with her and not pushing her to do more or be more than she can, making sure that she's comfortable in her environment and in her bubble, um, as you mentioned, which we'll talk a little bit about because I loved some of the sound bites that you gave me for the write-up for this event. So, okay, so you came to the mall and um, that event is something that we do with Monica a couple times a year, who is the owner of Barrington Barks and Behavior. She's one of our um, founding partners. 
Uh, talk to me a little bit about your experience and, uh, you know, any interactions that you and Sadie had with uh, other people there as well. Yeah. So um, when we first showed up, like I said, she was very vocal. Um, she was a little stressed out. But then once I started walking with her, um, she was doing great. Like she was sniffing all the dots, like exploring the mall, um, having a great time. And there were even there were dogs in front of us and behind us and also passing us as well. Um, but she did great um, once she able was able to kind of settle into things. So when we were walking through, I remember uh, Monica approached us and she was very calm. Um, Sadie actually went up to her and like, you know, sniffed her. And she just talked to me a little about Sadie and like how we were doing. Um, and it was just a really calming experience for me and for Sadie as well. And then uh, we found the snuffle mask, which she also really enjoyed. Um, so yeah, we had a really good experience. We actually walked around twice um, just because she was having such a good time um, and doing so well with her um, reactivity. So awesome. if I did walk in with her and she was still, you know, kind of vocalizing and really stressed out, I probably would have walked out and walked back in to see kind of see how she was doing. Um, but she just acclimated really well and had a great time. So, well, and tell me how old is Sadie and what is her breed? So Sadie turned uh, four in September. So she's about four and a half. Um, we did a DNA test on her uh, and she is half Great Pyrenees, half uh, American Pitbull. Oh, I wouldn't have uh, a guessed dash of Great Boxer. Pyrenees. <laughs> oh, wow. I bet that was surprising. Yeah, it was. We thought she was like a cattle dog mix is based on her markings. Um, but it makes sense with her behavior, how she's kind of a guard dog <laughs> at heart. Um, yeah. So that's and have sense. you had her since she was a puppy? Yeah. Um, so okay. we got her when she was about um, like 13 weeks old. Uh, okay. So she, according to the rescue, um, she was found about seven weeks old with her sister um, after her mom was hit by a car uh, down south in Arkansas. Oh, um, her mother, unfortunately, did not make it, um, but her and her sister did. Um, and so they shipped her up to us and that's how we got her. Oh, wow. And now just for anybody uh, watching live or on the replay, the, the critical so, uh, socialization period for a puppy is between eight and um, 16 weeks, sometimes a little bit later, depending on the uh, breed. But um, it sounds like some of that opportunity was missed for Sadie, yeah. unfortunately, which, uh, you know, again, can lead to reactive behavior here later on in life. Um, that is the story I hear for most people who rescue. It's just that critical period. They were not in your care. Um, so you didn't have any say over that. And, you know, there's some history there that you don't necessarily know about. So I think as reactive dog owners, we do all that we can to uh, give them the best life and um, help them as they develop and grow. So let's, I love the um, analogy that you gave when we were talking before about Sadie's bubble. And that every dog has a different size bubble needed to work through reactivity. Can you tell me a little bit more about what you mean? Yeah, of course. Uh, so Sadie, when she was younger, her bubble was quite large. <laughs> um, even if we would see a dog or a person, like even out in the distance, like she would be barking, lunging, um, wasn't able to calm down. So now her bubble is a lot smaller. Um, so we're able to see dogs and, um, you know, people, uh, and she's able to stand her thresholds um, and, and be less stressed and calm. But some days if she's having a hard time, uh, sometimes we need to take, you know, a couple of, you know, 50, 25 feet away from people and dogs um, until she's able to feel more comfortable. But every dog, depending on their uh, personality, on how reactive they are to uh, or sensitive to other people or, or dogs, um, some dogs might need to be like way behind um, dogs and other people when we're going for the pack walks. And that's OK. And it's just figuring out where your dog is at that day, like where their threshold is um, and just look, looking for signs to see when they're feeling nervous, when they're feeling stressed um, and then acclimating and adjusting based on what you're seeing. Yeah, I completely agree. And I know when you and Sadie come to most of the events, you usually feel most comfortable in the back. Yeah. Yeah. Have you and Sadie ever migrated to the front or closer to the middle of the pack? I'm just curious if that's something you feel she'd be comfortable with or if you think she really does feel more comfortable in the back. Yeah. So definitely when we first start walking, um, she does the best in the back because she is a little excited. She's a little stressed. Um, so it was good for her just to kind of watch the other dogs and acclimate to what we're doing. Um, but towards like the middle of the walk, towards the end, like I am able to get, you know, next to other dogs, um, closer to other dogs. 
Um, it's just the beginning is definitely the hardest for her. Um, but yeah, definitely towards the middle end of the walk, I'm able to get closer to the other dogs and the people. So she's a little more tired and she's yeah. Yeah, a, a little less stressed. So one of the big things for me, I found with my reactive dog, when I started practicing kind of parallel walking with other reactive dogs, what I noticed is because they were moving in the same direction, obviously that was key. They weren't um, direct staring at each other. But then what I thought was particularly interesting when they were walking together is the things that they would sniff together. So their noses would be right next to each other and it was okay. And that absolutely amazed me. I mean, again, I am not a dog trainer. We have wonderful partners. There's no need for me to be a dog trainer because I can um, access uh, all the great knowledge we have available to us. But uh, do you find that Sadie has engaged in anything like that? Yeah, so parallel walks are huge. Um, so when I do acclimate her like more towards the middle of the pack, um, it's definitely not like in between dogs, it's more like side by side with other dogs if we're able to have the spacing to do that. Because I find that, yeah, like you said, like we're walking in the same direction. Um, she's sniffing, the other dogs are sniffing, and sniffing is a very calming behavior for dogs. Um, so, and it's very non threatening. So, if other dogs are sniffing, she's like, oh, okay, they're not paying attention to me. Like, that's cool. I can sniff next to them and I feel more comfortable. Um, so, sniffing, yeah, is huge um, for, for reactive dogs or sensitive dogs. Yeah, it's a great focused activity. And I know we've done a lot last year and we're going to continue to do a lot more this year to to help our members in our community understand the benefits of um, canine enrichment mental stimulation uh, for dogs um, and uh, as kind of a side note to that the same for humans we're looking more at opportunities to get uh, humans more involved in the enrichment for them um, because it's calming as you mentioned it's relaxing and then that transitions down the leash to their dog so there's some different things we're trying with our partners to uh, bring everybody down, you know, relaxed and and calm. So, well, tell me, too, because this was something interesting uh, that we discussed last night in our reactive dog support group, which was the kickoff session for 2023. Uh, we were talking about the environments that we walk our reactive dogs in, uh, like open fields versus uh, forests, where the dogs seem to feel a little bit more claustrophobic for a lack of a better word but um, they can't see you know past past the trees they're not really sure of what's coming up what's behind them versus the open field concept where they can see for quite a ways and um, reactive dog owners have said they've noticed that their dogs feel a lot more comfortable in that environment are you noticing that with Sadie as well Oh yeah. A hundred percent. I even noticed when I'm just walking her like, you know, on my own or with Everest and we're coming like around the bend on a trail and she can't see around the bend. Like she's kind of, your ears are up and she's kind of like perked forward, kind of like, Oh, is someone around that bend? Like what's going on? Um, so I think the more that she's able to see, so like big open fields are great. Um, so she can see if there's a person coming or a dog coming and then we're able to, to adjust um, based on that. So yeah, that's huge. Yeah, I think what you just said is really key with um, seeing what's coming, an unleashed dog, a human, uh, another, you know, whatever it might be, whatever they're reactive to. Um, I think that's really helpful. And, uh, you know, one of the things we've started added, adding to the events that we post on our website is, is this walk or is this adventure good for a reactive dog? So we've put more uh, information and research and detail into letting people know uh, if the adventure that we've put together is appropriate for a reactive dog. And I know um, the last time I saw you was this past Wednesday at the event that we did at Wagon Hill Farm, which really is a great area. I mean, we have that short um, walk through the trees down to the water, and then we've got the walk through the woods. Um, but then we had the open area down at the bay, and then we had the open area as we made our way up to the wagon. So you know, what did you think, what was her comfort level as she went in and out of these different habitats from the, the kind of the, for the wooded path to the open area by the bay, then back into the forest and then into the fields. Did you notice like anything different about her body language? Yeah. So I definitely noticed um, when we went into the woods area, uh, she was a little more tense. Um, her ears were a little more forward. And I think Part of that is just due to the fact that a lot of people, or not a lot of people, but some people could be coming the other direction. Um, and I think we passed by two or three dogs um, during that walk um, in the woods part. And that was a little bit of a struggle for her, but she did really well. Um, but then when we went, left the woods, went back out to the open field area, I noticed that she 
um, was less stressed, like her body language was more relaxed. Um, and I think that's just due to the fact, like we talked about before, she kind of see what's going on. Um, she felt more comfortable in that sense. That's great. Well, and what kind of techniques work for you when you're in more of an environment that seems a little bit uncomfortable for Sadie um, and you, you know, somebody is coming with their dog? So I always pull off to the side. Um, I do almost like a curve shape around the dog because if I just pull off to the side and make her sit or whatever, she's still going to be amped up and it's going to be really hard for her. So I just pull off to the side as, as far as I need to into the woods or into the field, wherever we are, um, and do almost like a curve shape. Um, I use my treats to keep her attention. Um, or if she's feeling a little more comfortable, like I might allow her to, you know, see the other dog um, and like look back at me. So we do a lot of like look at that games. Um, but mostly I try to keep her attention on me. Um, and if she's really having a hard time, I just literally take a handful of kibble and throw it on the ground. Um, and she's able to search for it and sniff for it. And that helps her calm down and takes her mind off the other dog passing us. Yeah, that works well for Dakota, uh, too. She's highly treat motivated. Um, uh, I've heard last night in the reactive dog support group, too, one member shared that she has like little peanut butter packets that she can whip out and like start pumping out the peanut butter or the baby food or something like that. Um, that's always a great one, too. You just have to have those little um, uh, strategic weapons available in your pocket as you go out there. So um, talk to me about, just because I've had my own experience as well, uh, talk to me about the when you're not with the pack, what is kind of your routine with getting Sadie out there? And do you worry about walking here in your neighborhood? Do you have areas you can go where she feels more comfortable? Yeah, so I'm lucky to have a lot of uh, trails close by to my house. Um, so I'm able to figure out which trails are going to be monitorly tra traffic or low traffic areas um, based on like the day and the time of year and whatnot. Um, we do actually go to Northwood Meadows pretty frequently, um, which can be a, a high traffic area depending mm -hmm. on the day. Um, but definitely just being mindful of, you know, if, the, if there's lots of dogs, lots of people, and it's a traffic area um, in general. But what I honestly have found um, is that just by attending the pack walks, like her comfort level with other dogs and people um, like coming up on trails and walks like has been a million times better. Um, okay. She used to be very, very, very um, anxious, you know, by seeing other dogs on trails. And like sometimes she would have a hard time coming back down after a reaction. Um, but now I'm able just to pull off on the, into the woods, pass by the dog, and it's a non-issue. Um, it's, it's been great. So, well, and as I recall too, you have, I think something on your leash that's yellow, that notifies people that she needs a little bit of space or she's reactive. What, what kind of tools have you used there to help? Yeah. So I have one more with the pack. Obviously uh, everyone knows the yellow bandana means, you know, give me space. I need a little more space. So it's really helpful for when I am walking with um, the pack, but when I'm not walking with the pack, um, people, when I pull off into the woods, like no one usually follows us, which is nice. <laughs> um, but if someone is approaching us um, or, you know, their dog is off leash or we need more space, um, I just usually, you know, call out, hey, like, she's not great with other dogs. Like, can you please leash your other dog? Um, or can you please give a little more space if I'm not able to get give myself my own space that we need? And I love that you said that because I think that's something that's very key about loving a reactive dog is knowing the amount of space that they need and being able to advocate for your dog, being confident enough to say to other people, you know, look, you know, please don't approach or you know, I love Helen St. Pierre, one of our um, partners says, my dog's contagious. You know, I love that one. That yeah. always works. People run the other way. <laughs> but um, so I love that you're saying that. It, it sounds like you have a great confidence level. Um, you're advocating for Sadie. And the reason I bring that up is because I find there are a lot of reactive dog owners that don't have that confidence level and it can end up in issues or they feel that, oh, those people aren't going to like me. They're going to judge me. You know what? Who cares? Mm -hmm. This is your dog. This is your life. This is a, the, your world. And if they don't like you or appreciate the fact that you're advocating for your dog or call you a name, the B word is the thing that, <laughs> you know, comes to my mind the most often. Yeah. I, think that's, I should just have, t you know, the T-shirt that says, yes, I'm a bitch. Back off from my dog. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but those aren't your people. So, you know, don't don't feel that people are judging you. They are uneducated um, and, you know, it's our job to educate them. I think as reactive dog owners, um, I've had many, 
oh boy, the stories Ray could tell you, many run-ins with people um, off leash from me being very kind and calm and explaining to them why my dog needs additional room to me dropping F and S and all <laughs> kinds of other bombs. <laughs> oh my goodness. I yeah. have really scared some people <laughs> with my language walking my dog. But you know what? It's just sometimes I have no patience for the lack of respect and courtesy that people have with unleashed dogs. Um, and we could go on, this could be a whole lunch and learn all by itself. I, I, mm -hmm. I know I'm a, uh, you've probably dealt with this too. So um, that's why I love to, to talk with our reactive um, dog members and lovers because there's just, there's so much similarity. And I think if we all, um, you know, um, support each other, we'll feel that, that power to, to advocate and be confident. And we're going to um, incorporate some of those learning techniques as well with our programming this year to help the humans um, gain that confidence and really know that, um, uh, you know, that they can feel empowered to advocate for their dogs, which I think is important. Yeah, absolutely. Like it's definitely a learning curve. Um, when I first started to advocate for CD, it was very uncomfortable for me. I'm not um, a very confrontational person. So it was very uncomfortable for me just to ask for a little space for her or to say, can you please leave your dog? Um, but then as time goes on, like it's, it's almost become second nature um, just to advocate for your dog and getting that comfort level. So it definitely is a learning curve for sure. Yep. Yep. So let's see. Michelle says, uh, Laura and Sadie have made amazing progress. So proud of them both. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks for I'm chiming awesome. in for that. Because I know that you guys have been at events together as well. Yes. And, yeah. Um, uh, we have a question from one um, listener says, is if there's a social gathering following a hike, so we do things at breweries, wineries, um, all kinds of different places, swimming, picnicking, ice cream. Um, they are asking, um, such as on a deck, so like Flag Hill Winery, when we are on a deck there, they're wondering if you try to attend or do you just avoid with Sadie? So I look at, okay, are we going to have enough space to spread out if we need to? Um, if it's going to be close together, I just, I don't, um, I don't attend. But we did a couple, like there's one at Wagon Hill and then um, the Shepherd's Hill one, there was ice cream after, but there was enough room for us to spread out. Um, she had plenty of room and she was able to um, attend that um, the gathering. Yeah. And that's information we let our participants know ahead of time, because that's really important because, you know, that's how I essentially judge if I'm going to bring my dog. So I decided to bring Dakota to the Wagon Hill Farm one specifically for the reasons we were talking about with the open fields and such. Um, and also it was a smaller, more intimate gathering, which is what our pack adventures are. And they happen during the week. But um uh, you know, I, she wouldn't be successful at Flag Hill Winery. We're a little bit too packed in together. Um, you know, and this is information we'll let people know if we think, you know, if the walk portion might be comfortable, but the social gathering might not. So we'll always let you guys know that. Um, I have to give a shout out though, to one of our, um, uh, venues that we collaborate with, which is, um, Over the Moon, um, Farmstead in Pittsfield. Uh, they have a meadery. And they are so accommodating to us. I love their space for reactive dogs. So we had a large event there two, two Septembers ago, so fall of 2021. And they have this big outdoor space by a barn, and it has a, an overhang. And they had tables all set up with us for chairs, but they had spaced out the table so that, you know, people could have enough space for their dog as well. And then what they did is they had barrels with chairs, and they had hay bales with chairs. So what we were able to do is seat humans at the barrels and at the hay bales. And then the dogs could comfortably sit behind the barrel or behind the hay bale. The human could still see everybody, but the dog could comfortably be in its own little area and not have any direct stare with other dogs. It worked out fantastically. I think we had 30, 35 people there and about five or six were um, reactive dogs, um, oh, wow. reactive dog owners. I was so proud to be able to work with that organization because they took to heart what we needed and really accommodated us. And I, I think they made some good money off of us that day because people really appreciated um, the extra effort that they took to do that. So, you know, ever since that event two years ago, we've worked um, in more detailed ways with our um, 
venue partners to see if there are opportunities to make the events uh, more comfortable for people. Um, we've done some things successfully with Zorvino um, Winery, um, Fulcino, um, just explaining the needs that the, the dogs would need. Sometimes we'll bring our own barriers, but a lot of times it'll just be that the seating is spaced out. So let's say there's a table that fits eight, we'll only put four humans there, and then we'll allow areas for the dogs. So those are some of the different accommodations um, as we learn from our training partners and we're able to get our venues to accommodate that we are trying to do for our participants because we want as many of the things that we do to be inclusive to people um, so that you can go to a winery with your dog and enjoy yourself and you know they're relaxed in their bubble of space that we've been <laughs> able to create so i think that's really important that's awesome so laura are there any um tips resources advice you would give reactive dog owners who are you know who haven't attended an event before who want to an attend an event to to kind of get them um over that um fear of bringing their reactive dog on one of these adventures yeah so i would definitely say starting with the um ones that you have during the week because there's usually less people there um and even like less traffic in the public as well um so during the week adventures i think are great start for um, people who are you know, worried about their reactive dogs um, or, you know, need a little extra space. So I think that's a good idea. Um, and just not to be, I was so anxious. I was so worried. I was so anxious about attending the first event um, just because I was worried about Sadie's behavior. Are we going to be judged by other people? Are we going to be, um, you know, an issue for other dogs, for the people? Because I don't want to like, make other people or dogs feel uncomfortable at any point. Um, but that wasn't the case at all. Like our first um, pack walk, like Sadie had a little bit of a hard time at the beginning. Um, but people were just ignoring her, like walking past us. Like it was not like an issue. Like it was not an issue at all. Um, and it was just such a great experience for her um, just to be around other dogs and around other people and feel comfortable and safe. Um, so I would just say just don't be worried about other people's reactions. Um, everyone... I think a lot of people at, that do, you know, golden dog walks um, do have reactive dogs or anxious dogs in some in some way, um, and people who don't, um, they don't. There's no, there's no judgment at all. Yeah, and I think that's key. I think you know what you were feeling is typical of what um, most reactive dog owners are feeling, and you know, one comment I wanted to make because this is something we saw in our year end survey that. Um, some of the community members that took the survey said we are becoming a club for reactive dogs <laughs> and you know it, it's not that we intended that but due to the pandemic there are a lot more dogs mm -hmm. that developed reactive behavior because of the social isolation uh, is isol isolation there we go <laughs> <Nosy> in that <laughs> word. Um, and also for humans too so we you, we just wanted to provide an environment where people could get out and have social opportunities because um, it was terribly isolating. Whether you were an extrovert or an introvert, um, it, it just, it, it really played a number on um, many people's mental health. So if you were one of those people on our survey that said you're turning into a reactive dog um, uh, uh, company, maybe we are and that's okay. Um, but if you do not have a reactive dog, you are still also welcome, as long as you promise not to judge those of us who do have reactive dogs. <laughs> and I think the other big thing is to um, when, you know, people who have reactive or sensitive dogs, I think we're always concerned about their stress level. We're always worried this is going to stress them out. Like this is going to be a negative experience for them. Like we don't want to put more stress on them because they are anxious, usually in general, uh, dogs that are sensitive. So I think that was my other big worry too. Um, but I found the opposite. Um, like it made her more resilient um, when seeing other dogs out and about. Like it made her feel more comfortable. Um, and definitely as we progressed and like continued to join walks, like she showed up and she was like, oh, is there dogs here? Like that's cool. Like we're going to go walk with them. Like that's cool too. So I definitely think that um, people who are concerned or worried about stressing their dogs out too much. Um, it's probably not going to, you know, impact them in that sense. And if, if your dog is really having a hard time, like there's no reason why you can't just turn around um, and walk the other way and, you know, um, head home for the day. So, right. Really and I tell, I say this all the time to people, if you sign up for one of our events and it's not comfortable for you, it's not comfortable for your dog. First off, kudos for trying because that is the first big hurdle, but we will refund your money. I'm not going to keep 
money from anybody because it didn't work out. So I don't want that to be uh, a limiting factor for why you try uh, these events. So please sign up. Um, we're going to know that you're coming. We're going to alert our key members who we also see as ambassadors who attend uh, many of our events regularly. They may have reactive dogs or not, but they're going to be there to help answer questions and acclimate you um, to the uh, the way we do our adventures. You know, maybe they have an ambassador dog as well. That might be a good first meet for you if that's something that you're comfortable with. Uh, but again, please don't let that be the reason why you don't come because you're worried about, you know, being out. Uh, 20 bucks or, you know, whatever the cost of the event is. So, um, and then the other thing I wanted to say too, is we've made some additional changes uh, this year to uh, provide a more inclu inclusive and welcoming environment to reactive dogs um, and their people. Uh, some things that we learned in the survey that we did uh, for 2022. Um, one of the key things that we're doing is that um, at our events that are over um, 40 people or 40 dogs um, in attendance, like our doggy Easter egg hunt, that's coming up in April that um, usually we have about 40 to 50 dogs. We will have a um, certified professional trainer at um, each of those events. Um, usually it's more than one, but um, our partners are usually like vendors and they have their tables and stuff. But we actually do have um, a trainer on staff. Her name is Marie Rulo. Um, and she has been a uh, dog trainer and behaviorist for over 25 years. We just hadn't released that fact because um, she was an adventure guide and we didn't know where we wanted to go with our training offerings. But we um, found a great opportunity for her to act in a safety capacity. So she'll be at these events there to answer questions and just help people understand if the environment um, is comfortable for uh, their dog. So we're really excited about getting her involved in more of those larger events. So again, I hope that will be a reason too why you um, uh, choose to come out to some of these larger events and see if it see if it's right for you. That's awesome. So Laura, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And thank you, you know, for taking a leap of faith um, and going down that road uh, with Sadie. And thank you for most recently becoming a member. We appreciate that. Um, and I'm seeing you at more and more events, which I love. We're going to see you this Saturday as well. I know you're coming out to Burley Farms, which is now sold out. Um, and that's going to be another great event where we have a, a little bit of a wooded area and we have a field. Um, but even if you are not attending our events, but you're following where we go um, and what environments are good for reactive dogs, take them out there after we go through because we're leaving all kinds of good things for your dogs uh, to engage in and smell. So take advantage of, of our uh, coattails, if you will. So um, thank you, everybody, for chiming in today, for your questions, for watching. Um, if you have additional questions when you're watching on the replay, tag us. Um, I'm sure if you uh, tag Laura as well, she'd be happy to answer your questions. Absolutely. Um, and uh, Laura, again, thank you for your time. And um, I hope you have a great uh, rest of your day. And we'll see you on Saturday. Thanks, Tracy. You too. Thanks. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye.